excited about the potential for gene therapy, as I'm sure all the panelists are uh, this morning. We really have an opportunity with gene therapy to create durable treatments and potentially even curative treatments after as little as a single dose. And I think that has created a great deal of excitement within the industry. Uh, to top that off, gene therapy is potentially applicable to so many diseases, including a majority of the roughly 7,000 or more rare diseases that are out there on the market. But gene therapy, ha gene therapy has the ability not only to treat those rare diseases, but some non-rare diseases too, and I know some of the panel members are involved in, in trying to tackle um, some pretty significant uh, diseases with gene therapy. Uh, this morning, we have uh, a panel represents a lot of different parts of, of the gene therapy market. And before we get into it, I'll just ask each one of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly before we get into all the challenges that you guys face every day. Hi, I'm uh, Tim Miller, co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of AV Therapeutics. We do uh, primarily AV and <clears throat> some cell therapies. Um, looking at, uh, we have a GMP manufacturing center and um, four active clinical trials right now for uh, gene therapies. So, nice to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Petrusco, senior vice president of regulatory affairs and quality assurance at Voyager Therapeutics. And uh, Voyager is a gene therapy company uh, dedicated to uh, addressing the unmet medical needs in neurodegenerative degenerative disorders uh, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS, uh, Friedrich's ataxia. And uh, I've been in the, uh, the industry for 30 plus years and primarily focused on regulatory affairs dealing with the FDA, EMA, MHRA, and all the others. And have <laughs> 32 approvals of uh, NDAs, BLAs, and uh, supplementary applications. Good morning. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole O'Brien. I'm with Brammer Bio. Uh, we were recently acquired by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, Brammer was founded about three and a half years ago and um, is primarily a uh, contract development and manufacturing organization that um, is involved in all sorts of different viral vector types and manufacturing platforms. Um, we produce clinical, commercial material, um, and offer process and analytical development services. Good morning, uh, Jeff Walsh. I work for Bluebird Bio. We're a gene therapy, cell therapy company based in Cambridge, now with um, offices all over the world, and it's, it's really a product of uh, expanding manufacturing uh, in North Carolina, some research in Seattle, and now with our first approved product, Zintegro in Europe. We've uh, expanded quite extensively throughout um, Europe and are going through all of the challenges associated with taking a product from the original days of research uh, all the way through now commercialization. Uh, I'm so excited to be here with this group of panelists to get into it. All right. Uh, good morning, Ran Zhen, Chief Technical Officer at Watcher Therapeutics. Uh, Watcher Therapeutics is a gene therapy company using uh, hematopoietic um, stem cell based gene therapy as a platform. We currently have a one commercial product on the market and the three late stage programs going through commercialization. Very excited to be here to share our learning and also learn from our industry colleagues. So, well, thank you all for, for joining us. We're gonna sort of work our way through the development process this morning. So we're gonna start off a little bit towards the front. Um, we know many of, of you partner with other companies to either bring in technologies or, or develop products. So I'm gonna start off talking a little bit about some of the challenges with those early partnerships with in licensing uh, technology technologies. Um, Jeff, can I start off with you this morning? Sure. Um, so as, a, as an organization, uh, we've spent a lot of time not just licensing in IP, which is the foundation of, of Blue, one of the foundations of Bluebird, um, but also technologies um, and, and products as well. And there's so many ways we can go with this question. Um, some of, the, some of the early challenges in the early stages um, are really just identifying strategically 
what are the tools and capabilities that you need within the company. And I'll use our, our oncology business maybe as an, as an anchor here. Uh, about two years ago, uh, in the CAR-T and, and TCR world, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about not just liquid tumors, but solid tumors as well, and trying to identify all of the um, technologies, capabilities that one would need to be able to be successful in a particular solid tumor world. And for us, it ended up being um, four categories uh, strategically. Um, some of them include having a really good binder or target. Um, having great antibodies. Uh, some of them related to how do you break through the tumor microenvironment. And so for us, the challenge, the key challenge in the beginning was just identifying where you wanted to play. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the great challenge we have is the fact that there are so many companies out there now, if you break each one of those areas down, and I know I referenced two of, two of the four, but if you break them down, there are four, five, six, seven different companies or technologies that you could go pursue. And so really understanding deeply those technologies and then starting the dialogue with those that you think are um, the best of breed and usually there's two or three that you think are best of breed and then having the discussions and trying to get a deal done. And many times it's not the first that you pursue, it's the second or the third for whatever reason. Either you couldn't get to come to terms or they weren't interested in partnering and so for me, that, that was the biggest first challenge, for, in particular as we built the oncology business from, from the ground up. Um, the other business had been established, there was some IP already established, and the programs were already in the clinic when Bluebird became Bluebird. Um, so that, that's, that's one of my, certainly can talk about others as, uh, as we go along. Perfect, perfect. Tim, comments? Yeah, you know, Jeff brings up a great point that, you know, when you, you in license, really what you're in licensing a lot of the time is the intellectual property that comes with a program. I think some of the challenges, um, but really opportunities come from looking at a lot of the academic programs that are out there. So, you know, when you go back into 2013, 2014, 2015, you saw a lot of companies um, go out and try to find, you know, new gene therapy programs, AAV, lentiviral, some of the, the, the CAR-T programs. You know, and the challenges that came with a lot of that is you sacrifice, you get efficacy, lots of efficacy data, in, right? One of the big challenges is coming in and trying to find, you know, a two-year mouse study or something where you were able to look at it, some form of dose escalation and identify proof of concept. But the challenge of that is you sacrifice safety, right? Because uh, a lot of times they don't either have the funding or really the thought process to go through and say, oh, we're gonna do a safety study as part of this efficacy study. So, you know, coming in and saying, great, you've got a whole lot of, ef of efficacy data, but how do you help them kind of come back and say, well, now we need to go back and do some efficacy. So one of the challenges is you can actually go in and say, can you save tissues? You know, make sure you save tissues from an animal study that you did. Um, yeah, that's one of the things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Maybe if I can, I can just add to please, that. I think it's, you're yeah. bringing up a really important point, especially as it relates to products and, and pursuing products as opposed to just, as opposed to just IP. Um, and, and that's that there's, there is no real great roadmap for this field. So the correlation between that preclinical data, even though it might look good from an efficacy standpoint and, and maybe a dearth of data on the safety standpoint, uh, from a safety standpoint, there are no clinical correlative data and we're all learning that as, as we go right now, is trying to figure out are there correlations to, anim to animal models or not. And a lot of times we're having to depend on the clinical data to inform next generation and next generation and next generation, and it's those next generation products that ultimately become the winner. Um, we've seen that in our own programs, and thalassemia, we're in a third generation program because we kept iterating on the manufacturing side. And it's hard from a licensing perspective to be able to understand that and really know the clinical correlative. And you almost have to call, go into these relationships knowing that the first product may not be your end product. Um, and that you're going to have to have an engine behind, translational engine behind that to learn from that academic program or industry program um, and bring in the technologies I was referencing before to continue to iterate because you need, we need to continue to constantly learn the clinical environment, uh, more so than any field I think uh, we've been a part of. And I think the other challenge related to that is when you bring in academia, academic programs because of what I just described too, Replicating data is critical. One of the things we found is bringing in early stage academic programs when we went to go replicate the data, and I know this is somewhat of a, of a conversation with all 
commercial stage companies about trying to replicate data from uh, academia, but you really have to make sure that what is being conveyed as fact, you're able to uh, replicate because everybody's learning um, in this process and even more so uh, subject to small variations in manufacturing changes that you couldn't have anticipated. So there's, there's lots of pitfalls there, and you have to go in, I guess, eyes wide open knowing that you don't know everything and you're going to have to learn, even yeah. when you get it in-house. Yeah, and there's actually a, a, just a great follow-on to that story, too, is something very similar. Like, um, when getting into AAV programs, right, and you're looking at coming in with efficacy data, sometimes you're coming in with, and you're going to have to switch the promoter, or you're looking at things that, you know, maybe the packaging efficiency is not very good, and you're coming up with a heterogeneous product where you're trying to get to a homogeneous product. So going in and having to tweak things, once you've already got the two-year efficacy study, how do you go back and redo a portion of that to do bridging? But another one of those kind of challenges. Which actually leads us nicely into one of the next questions, um, which has to do with transitions. So one of the challenges you all face is sort of scaling up your, your processes um, as you're moving along, along from preclinical to clinical, et cetera. Um, Ran, it would be great to have you comment on um, what are some of the challenges you face? How, how does Orchard think about this? Yeah, definitely there are uh, quite a few challenges when we're thinking about the transition from preclinical to clinical, from early clinical to late <laughs> clinical, and through commercialization processes. So uh, several areas that we uh, have encountered in terms of challenges from technological perspective, processes, analytics, um, and also from strategic perspective in terms of regulatory strategy, and also the talent, the workforce, and the infrastructure. So when we think about the technological uh, aspect of the challenges, um, our technology platform is HSC-based uh, ex-vivo autologous gene therapy, and we use the lentiviral vectors to uh, introduce transgene to the cells and then put the cells back to patient. So the first thing is the viral vector uh, production. As we know that the current viral vector production compared to the proteins and biologics is still less mature from productivity perspective and the process of product consistency perspective. So we have encountered a lot of those challenges in, in and uh, the early days and the still uh, facing those challenges, although we're working through that. On the cell therapy part, the current technologies, uh, just from manufacturing process perspective, are pretty manual and labor intensive. Uh, clean room and uh, um, all the complications when you're doing early clinical trials or late clinical trials, you are dealing with a smaller population of patients. For autologous gene therapy, when we think about going to commercial, you have to think about the scalability and uh, uh, the complexity of your manufacturing processes along with the supply chain. Analytical is a big part of it, and I think a lot of people think about the manufacturing only focus on the processes, but on the back end, to have a reliable, precise, accurate, uh, rapid analytical technology to release your product is really key. And I, I think that's an area that deserves a lot of attention. Um, now, moving to the regulatory front, I think very often, you know, we talked a little bit about the in-licensing of the product. If you are not the company to start from the very beginning, and you have to really deal with how you quickly formulate your strategy from a regular perspective, and especially to deal with some of the comparability challenges as you have to make some changes uh, as you move the program from clinical to commercial. Um, you know, this field grows so fast, we can't underestimate the challenges um, on, on the workforce and the talent. And there's uh, a war for talent in this, in this <laughs> space. And uh, we don't really have enough you know, people and uh, talented workforce, scientists, engineers, <coughs> operators, um, really on the you know, code chain um, um, professionals to, to really manage the entire uh, processes. 
um, you know, last but not least, and you know, we are a young company. Watchart is only about three years old. When we first started, we were pretty much virtual, and we rely on up today, and we rely on our strategic partners in CDMO space to help us to commercialize our programs. We don't have any in-house infrastructure. We have labs to develop processes, but the capability is limited. When you're thinking about commercializing your products, and especially you have a very rich uh, pipeline, you really have to think about how to build your infrastructure and have a, a network of manufacturing and the supply chain to reduce and diversify the risk and ensure supply. So that's probably just a few. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of challenges and certainly the competition for, for talent is, is a, good, uh, a good call out. Yeah. Um, you did mention some of the challenges on, on the regulatory side and Bob is our one expert on QARA up here. Could, could you comment on, on how to best navigate some of those challenges, especially scale up and potentially changing your process as you go. Okay, I'll give you an example. <laughs> and that uh, at Voyager, uh, we use uh, the A and B vector, and uh, we use those particular uh, capsids, and uh, we uh, in license uh, the uh, various transgenes uh, based upon the condition uh, we're evaluating, and so we we'll receive the material. And so one of the things that's absolutely necessary is to consider the source. Where is that material coming from? Have that documented? What kind of analytical tests have they done there? And really do the check on those vendors to make sure that it's consistent. And if they do make changes, they let you know. And so that's very important to really understand that, those characterizations about that. And as you're moving forward, you have to determine whether or not uh, that material is something that you're going to take forward, or are you going to change it? And uh, are you going to put in the promoters? Are you changing things uh, on the outside, changing the capsid? And how does that relate to that initial information you have? So when you're looking at the tests, and it was mentioned by Jeff about uh, repeating those studies, the animal studies, and, and seeing the effect, one thing may be the product itself. The other may be the variation in that model. And we've seen models where it's, uh, you do the same test in these animals three or four times in three or four different studies, you get different results. Why is that? And so if you control the product, then you know most likely it might be the model itself and the variation there, where you go back and you really characterize that information. So I think one of the things from the regulatory perspective is really have that documentation of any study you perform, what is the material, uh, what was used, and what were the sources. So that'll help. And you're going along and saying now, uh, or how are we going to scale this up? Are we going to keep it in those cells in, in, in the area? Uh, HEC 293, easy to use. All the investigators have that. But if you're looking at that for a, a long-term solution for supply, say for uh, systemic administration, that might not be the appropriate cell line because of uh, trying to scale out, because it's very difficult to scale up with that type of uh, product. And so if you change the cell line, say going to baclovirus, when do you do that? And obviously the sooner the better. So even in preclinical, if you can do that and convert over and do those studies with that type of a system and changing that cell line, it's easy to make those changes then because then you would use that material in your toxicology studies going forward and you're saying that material is representative of what you're going to use in the clinic. And so you have to document as you go along any potential changes, new vendors, uh, new sources of nutrients, and you're, you're evaluating that uh, along the lines of uh, what are those critical factors that make a difference for that product. And, and, and working forward because it's this iterative process of characterization and understanding your product and also looking at those particular attributes, how much change and variability can you accept uh, in each of the, one of those parameters that would not make a difference to that product. And then you have to look at the comparability protocols and look at your analytical testing. And within the, 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 the boundaries of that analytical test, can you demonstrate comparability? And you need to look at that. The other is, uh, another important aspect or the, is the uh, 
impurity profile, the, the potential contaminants that are in there, what are the acceptable levels of DNA as you move forward. And so it's the process where earlier on it's easier to make the change, but as you go down and, and going forward, it's much more difficult. Prior to um, changing in the clinic, you'll need to do a, a comparability protocol. And if you're doing that sooner rather than later, it will be most difficult doing it in the phase three or a pivotal study uh, changing, especially if you're changing a cell line in dramatic changes. And what you might show initially for comparability might not be acceptable later because the, the barriers Barrier to that time. change is much higher because what you're using in that clinical trial it has to be applicable to the commercial product. And, and so there's a push to bring that um, commercial-like or actual commercial product into the clinical trial so that you're demonstrating the efficacy of that. And when it's out on the market, it's that, that uh, situation where you can feel comfortable and confident. The agency feel that way and you will feel that way in giving it to patients. And so one of the things is that it's that balance of how you do things and, and when you, uh, how much resource you put in to these products. And, and when I say that is uh, for a small company that's starting up, the challenge is to get that into the clinic as soon as possible to demonstrate some benefit so you can generate the funds that continue that research. Uh, in contrast, the agency is looking at if you're going fast, you're going for accelerated approval or one pivotal study, we want you to have as much as possible or even possibly invest into the commercial type material, which is very time consuming and expensive. And so it's that benefit risk or where you want to be, get it into the clinic quickly to show something versus uh, going to the end game and getting approval if you're showing dramatic results. And so that bar, you know, there, when you're going for a commercial and the quality of that product, there's no compromise. Any other product that's out there uh, will have that, that same rigor, and it doesn't matter if it's five patients or 500 million patients, the same quality uh, that has to be met prior to approval is there. Uh, absolutely. Can, can, I, can I add to that? Because you're yeah. bringing up a couple of really interesting points. That uh, One is you're referencing the concept of fast to clinic versus fast to commercial. Yeah. And given the regulatory environment that we find ourselves in, which seems to be very, um, accommodating is never the right word, but uh, favorable to a gene therapy industry that's obviously bringing some crazy good data to, to the marketplace and to patients, um, it, you really do have to make that decision. Do you want to be fast to the clinic when you're not going to be phase three ready? Because we can go, you can go phase one to phase three pretty quickly in some of these small Same trials. Point. And if you're making the decision to be fast to clinic, you're not going to be fast to commercial because you're going to likely have to pursue something alternative in a phase three. Um, I'd love to hear your comments on that. Um, but also, if you're, if you're intending to be uh, fast to commercial, obviously slower to clinic, but the potential to take a phase one that has some of the commercial components to it um, to potentially translate then or expand that trial to become a phase three. And I know that's very difficult, making it sound very simple, but there is that opportunity that we're afforded in this environment and given the, the size of trials that we're pursuing and the desperate need of the patients that we're trying to, trying to treat. It's a, it's a really interesting, unique thing, at least in this environment today, uh, given the regulatory environment, some of the therapies that are out there. Yes, and then it's the other part is you're making changes in that product. So if you're you know, quick to the clinic, when you're making those changes, are there any clinical outcomes or changes what you've seen from that earlier product? And how do you do that? Is it primarily on uh, doing comparability from a uh, chemical product? Or do you need some clinical data? And it's that balance. And what are those changes? And it's always a judgment call. If you make one or two changes, and they're relatively minor, you might be good. Or if you're changing to a new cell line, a new facility, a new contract manufacturer, uh, you change the scale up, the amount of, you know, the fermentation tanks, et cetera, are all those changes going to actually change the product? Mm -hmm. And how much change do you weigh in that to benefit risk to patients? Yeah. And, and you, uh, you tee up a, a good 
comment about working with a CDMO and a partner, and I want to give Nicole a chance to, to comment on that. Obviously, Bram has worked with numerous partners, so I'm sort of helping them through part of this, this process. From, from your perspective, what is the, the role you believe that uh, CDMO should play? How have you seen uh, people navigate through this transition? Yeah, I think one of the real challenges, um, which goes along with what both of you have said, is that um, a lot of the early proof of concept data um, that, that innovators and developers generate um, or universities will generate from which the developers are acquiring that product um, is generated with, the, um, with, with processes that are not scalable at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're looking at typically adherent type processes, adherent cell culture, centrifugation based downstream. These kinds of things aren't scalable at all. And, um, but there's the pressure to use those and not to make any changes because all the preclinical data was generated with that kind of, that kind of uh, a product. And um, so, you know, as a CMO, it's too early to get a hold of those. Usually the developer has just acquired those assets themselves and they are in a hurry to be quick to clinic. So you have to try to navigate, you know, the do you make those changes and take the time to do it, to get them clinical material using a process that's going to be scalable to commercial, or do you try to replicate what they've done in the past and make that material so that they can show their proof of concept all over again, replicate those results, and then be able to get their clinical material as fast as possible. Um, so those are very uh, real challenges that our clients face. Um, and uh, I would say that, there, that the pressure to be quick to clinic tends to win out, and that does provide real, uh, a real challenge going forward for them into late phase commercial. Uh, absolutely, and Ren, you want to make a decision? Yeah, you know, I just want to make a couple of comments, and I think there's a strong need to really understand the product and the processes, and I think this industry is still relatively young, and our product and processes are not very often well characterized, and I, I think, you know, again, um, an investment early on for a company to really understand the product uh, develop platform technology eventually will benefit uh, both fast to clinic and, and fast to, to commercial. If you really look at the biologics over the past 30 years and used to develop the processes, start you know, early stage development and then late stage development, but many companies have moved from you know, those two cycle development to a single cycle development by leveraging platform technologies. I also think that this industry, particularly in the cell and gene therapy space, is a little bit less forgiven to the CMC because the CMC first is on the critical path. And for biologics, you have a little bit more time um, to refine the processes. For cell and gene therapies, usually your trials are fast and you get the data and it's ready to go. And you don't really have a lot of opportunities um, to refine the process. So I think if the company for long-term growth to really think about the invest early on in product and process understanding and the platform technology will have a, a benefit in the long run. Uh, absolutely, and Tim, you want to add anything? We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, the, the fast the clinic, fast the commercial concept is really one that's really being embraced now because of the speed with which many of the programs can move, but you know, the other side of that is that I think you're seeing some of the regulatory agencies provide a little more guidance now mm -hmm. that they would like a bit more product characterization and you know, of course, qPCR, you know, or DDPCR for product characterization for AV. Well, it's certainly coming to a lot of groups' minds right now. So, you know, investing in that a little bit earlier um, and making sure that you know you are able to have a reproducible physical titer assay. Not to mention, as things move more to an infectious titer, is certainly you know, things that we're all, I think, facing, you know, when yeah. trying to move products from early stage to mid or late stage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that we've been talking about is, is partnering. Um, certainly one of the critical decisions uh, many of you have had to make is do you develop your product internally or do you outsource? So 
be interested to hear anyone's perspective on what criteria you use to, to make that decision. Speed or <laughs> 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 speed to uh, be able to get into a queue. I mean, certainly is a factor, I think, right now. I mean, again, that's part of that fast to the clinic, which usually ends up winning out, but uh, speed. I think that you know, coming from a CMO, obviously, I see uh, advantages. I see that our clients have certain advantages, and um, I feel like it's really around kind of three critical aspects. One, you get to really plug into the platforms, manufacturing platforms, um, starting materials like cell lines, uh, the facilities that are up and running already, different kinds of uh, technologies that are offered. Um, so you've got kind of a, a, a variety of ways in which you can do it and you can tap into that. Um, the operations, manufacturing operations, changeover procedures, all of those sorts of things that you don't then have to build. Quality systems, uh, validation, process characterization. So there's the, the capabilities and the, and the facilities you can plug right into as kind of one aspect. But then also, um, and I, I, I think this is really where a CMO can add value, if you have a CMO that's got experience and has been has a track record of having manufactured multiple different types of you know in gene therapy vectors vector platforms using different manufacturing technologies, um, most of those CMOs then have run into issues whether they are product specific issues dealing with a vector that maybe has a um, a long transgene or a toxic transgene or secondary structure that can cause issues with productivity or yields or product purity. They've had to overcome those sorts of issues. So you want a CMO that's had to deal with those kinds of issues, issues with tech transferring a process in because they've developed ways to deal with those issues, how to overcome systems for troubleshooting, um, and you can tap into that kind of expertise um, because they've been there, done that. So I think that's a second very important aspect. And then um, the third aspect, I think, which is really helpful too, is that this is such a, a changing regulatory landscape. It's, it's maturing very quickly. Yes. And so if you can tap into a CMO that has, is manufacturing products that are at various stages of clinical development, um, you can potentially get that um, feedback of, of where the regulatory and dis, um, um, landscape is going. What are um, you know other products seeing from the regulators, and whether it's with respect to adventitious viral clearance, and how do you implement that, and what's what's the latest thinking on that that you may not have given much thought to going you know going forward. You're relatively new to it or whether it's you know, the, the characterization of a product that, and, 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 and the, the newer aspects of that and what's being asked for. Um, you get to leverage all of that as well. And I think, I think for those three you know, reasons, if you're a relatively newer company, um, tapping into that can certainly save you a lot of time and costs up front. Um, and even if you're a, a company that's uh, relatively advanced, and you're, but you're getting into a new product or modality, you can really see those advantages. And, and Tim highlighted uh, one sort of important thing about making the decision, which was sort of, can you get in the queue? Um, obviously, this is um, an area where there's been a bottleneck of capacity. Um, there's been a lot of, of different organizations, in, including Brammer, that have been building out capacity. Anyone want to get out their crystal ball and mm -hmm. hypothesize if we are building enough capacity, too much capacity? I, I, I personally think <laughs> that uh, you're going to see some, um, <clears throat> some organizations jump in because now of the issue that you've got uh, capacity constraints, for sure, and you've got enough products out there that are showing enough promise that it's, you know, the, the players that would put money down to establish um, the Brammers of the world, uh, I think are, are now starting to recognize that this is an industry yeah. and it's worth investing in. So I think you're gonna see more capacity come, not less, um, I think. Can I, can I add one other, one yeah, other comment as it relates to this conversation? I, we, we had an is interesting history in that we've been um, CDMO-based organization for clinical and commercial, um, both in the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, and in Europe. And 
the, uh, we, we've had to go through a process of determining <clears throat> where we want to leverage CDMOs and where we want to bring it in-house. And we uh, acquired a manufacturing facility down in North Carolina about a year and a half, two years ago. And the decision there was around the translational component of it. To, to your earlier point, getting in a queue, and if you truly need to translate, and if you want to be a company that is seeing clinical data, translate to next generation, and be able to have that iterative loop of development, it is difficult to be in a um, CDMO environment and be able to then quickly pivot and have the flexibility to get a slot. Um, so what, where, where we've said we want to have it in-house, um, even though we have a very vast CDMO network that will persist, is to make sure that we have that translational capability in-house on the vector side and the drug product side uh, for an autologous therapy so that we can rapidly iterate and test new constructs. And with the gene editing world out in front of us, um, there are lots of ways you can gene edit uh, a cell. And the ability going forward to have that iterative nature of a, of a company to uh, constantly test different uh, structures, not only preclinically, but then clinically too. I think it's going to be incredibly important and going to be a strategic advantage for those that do it really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, oh. I was just going to say, uh, along those lines, I think it's important as you're starting out, uh, looking at uh, what you want to do. If you want to get the product, you want some GMP material, uh, you're almost required uh, in, the, in the element of speed to go with the, the contract manufacturer. Uh, and once you have that, then you, then you look at it for the longer term. Can you afford and at what point does it make sense uh, to actually have your own manufacturing facility and hiring the large group and it's like a three to five year process and make investment in the facility uh, changing it or building from scratch, uh, the, the people, the inspection, and everything else that goes along with it, that's very cost intensive. Plus, when you're there, if you're not generating any income, uh, you're, you have a high burn rate of keeping all those employees, and how much material are you actually making? And should you use that money to actually have it internally in your own lab that's not a GMP facility, but you know, research and doing all the iterative changes and research, and then putting it into a CMO later on. And then further, um, when you're getting close to commercialization, make that decision if you want to be in the yeah. business of doing it, and will you get the returns and revenue uh, to uh, do that in the long range. But you have to plan like five years ahead at least in the facilities and where the workers are going to be if you want to do it yourself. And, and, and the other thing about that is, do you want to have that in somebody else's hands with a, you know, a contract manufacturer that will continue and you trust and believe will do the things and be up to speed for all the uh, FDA inspections and clearance and has that experience? And right now, there are not very many that have the experience of clearing uh, cell and gene therapies uh, for commercialization. So yeah. many bring it in, some don't, and so there are different ways. But I think yeah. the earlier companies will go with a contract manufacturer. And where this is going, and if you look at uh, monoclonals as an example, there was uh, very, uh, very little production of monoclonals that was concerned about that. Then the, uh, the man contract manufacturers came in, and then there was an overabundance, and then it came back down to a, a level, a steady state. So I think we're going to see more, and there might be an overshoot. Uh, the other thing I see with the you know, proof of concept and these products now that we're going to see larger pharma companies coming in, we're seeing it now, either acquiring the smaller companies or actually doing research in this area for some of the uh, uh, larger patient population diseases and which are more difficult to treat to understand whether or not these therapies are going to be effective in a polyclonal versus a, you know, a mo mono monogenetic disease. We're going after low-lying low fruit right now, which we can, and been very successful, but some of the other diseases uh, are gonna be much more difficult to really show whether you knock down a certain protein that is the essence of the disease, or is it just one small factor, and other things may mitigate that. So we're gonna be seeing that, but as a consequence, we'll see larger companies coming in and then investing in their own manufacturing because they do have the money and capacity to do that. Absolutely. Did you want to add on to it? Well, there's, there's an interesting synthesis between a lot of the, what the panelists have said, it, but it's an interesting crux point, right, or a turning point. <clears throat> You're trying to find the ability to get something into the clinic. 
you know, and I'm just hearkening back to 2014-ish when we went out and we looked at, we did a landscape analysis on the CDMOs that were out there that says, okay, can you purify, you know, can you make GMP AAV to a certain scale? Right, and many of them said, yes, we can make AAV, and when you did a little bit more diligence, you got in and said, well, have you ever made AAV before? <laughs> and, they said, and they said, well, we've made Lenti, <laughs> right? And we said, well, okay, and then, so that was a cut, right? And so the next level was, okay, well, you find some that actually have made AAV, and they say, well, have you made AAV9, or have you made AAV5? And they said, well, we've made AAV5. I said, okay, well, can you make AAV9? So well, we haven't done it to scale yet. Right, so thinking about challenges coming in, going into some of these new programs, right, and to your point was just, yeah, you have to find someone that's actually been able to do it to scale so that you need to be able to get into the clinic to do a value inflection point, right? Yeah. And so, to, yeah, to echo your point, I, I see the same thing coming, that there's going to be this, a lot of large pharmas looking and saying, this is a specialized skill set. I mean, earlier you were saying, this is, I mean, we're all trying to find people that are, are able to, you know, do a lot of the bench work, a lot of the, you know, be in the GMP facility to be able to do a lot of the production. You just, it's a specialized skill set. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is. see the it, acquisitions it, coming, right? It, so. yeah. it, it, absolutely. So it really boils down to a series of decisions, not single decision. I think you are talking about uh, what to build versus what to buy. And I think it's very important to figure out what critical capabilities, differentiating capabilities you need to build in-house versus the capabilities that out there that you can leverage. The second part is more of a timing of build versus buy. I think it's really, really important to really figure out um, if you, for example, manufacturing capacity. You're a small company, you build it too early, you may invest without a return or a near-term return, you know, to, to your point earlier. And if you met too late, and you may get into yourself a situation that you don't have sufficient capacity or don't have the reliability or the speed required to deliver um, your commercial products. And that's, that's really, really, you know, a challenging uh, situation. And the, the third part, you know, it's really come down to um, collectively um, how you want your um, capability network looks like. Um, I don't think any company should just say, well, make a singular decision, either buy or build. I think a strategic partnership is really, really important. Uh, where to partner and how to partner. And I think that you know, working out a long-term relationship with CDMOs that is a strategic, it benefits both companies, is really key to uh, success in the future. And some of these products are very complicated, right? They, a cell therapy can have um, the cell manufacturing that's required, it can have the viral vector manufacturing that's required to use as a starting material for the cell mm -hmm. therapy, and that viral vector might require plasmid manufacturing to make the viral vector. So, mm -hmm. you know, do you build and, and build all of those capabilities? Do you build some of those capabilities? Yeah. Um, you, know. you know, I often hear, you know, from people saying that we really want everything in control in our hand. It's impossible <laughs> to have everything <laughs> in your own hands. It's impractical. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a lot about challenges. Um, now I want to pivot to a, the fun topic of cost. So, so obviously this is something the industry spends quite a bit of time talking about. How can we take cost out of the process, whether that's by doing things right the first time or just taking things out of the, the process when it's working. Uh, would be interested to have anyone on the panel comment on what do you think are one or two of the ways that we will be able to take significant cost out of the development or commercialization of gene therapies? Maybe I can. I was going to say, that, um, you know, I think. I think that this is a relatively new field from a CMC perspective. Um, so the, the, the cost of goods in making these things is still quite high. And the reason for that is that it is such, um, it, it's in such its na nascency. 
Um, and I think there's similarities with the way that antibodies were, were made to begin with, right? So you had these roller bottle processes and adherent cell lines and they were producing <laughs> you know, MIGs per liter, and the cost of goods were really high, and that's, that's similar today for these viral vectors mm -hmm. where you're dealing with, you know, adherent processes, you're dealing with um, transient transfection that lack scalability, and the productivity, specific productivities aren't as high as they need to be. Uh, whether it's Lenti or AAV, the, the purification yields, spe um, you know, especially around Lenti, are are challenging, um, and I see that you know there's just a long way to go. There's a lot of smart people out there working on these um, these technologies to try to um, find one or more, whether it's a producer cell line or. Uh, baclovirus-based production for AAV that can address some of these challenges in productivity and yields and have a, uh, but, but, but right now still have their own challenges. And as we, uh, we're, as we start to develop these and get more technological advancements around producing these, it's going to bring the cost of goods down to make them, um, similar to where now antibodies were at, you know, tens of grams per liter now and the cost of goods have gone, gone way down. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we've got a way to go um, on the CMC side, but I, I think we're, um, we're gonna be seeing some changes and, and advancements. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that uh, with the basic research, much, much of it is done in the HEC 293, which is very difficult to scale, scale up and had to scale out and build more facilities and, and more uh, programs to do that. Uh, we've taken a different approach and gone as, as soon as we can with the baclovirus system. And, uh, the back of virus system can produce uh, large quantities at a, a significant reduction in the price. And so for uh, <coughs> systemic diseases where you have to give it parenterally in large doses, uh, this would, is one way to reduce the cost. The other thing that's going to happen is for more common diseases, and I look at the uh, hepatitis C example where there are cures there, the price was high and then the price act essentially came down with the competition, but also uh, the ability to make the product. And also, as, as you're making that for a larger population, the cost of goods per person comes down. So realistically, it's not going to be the $4 million product per each patient uh, for a, a relatively common disease. So it'll be one way is the amount of patients, that yeah. the cost per patient we will mm -hmm. bring the price down in, in those particular fashions. So I see that in the future as a way to do that, but it's, it's also important to make sure that it's uh, scalable and you have a, a, a large amount of quantities to handle that in the future. So one of the things that we've done is gone early, especially for those conditions that where it's gonna be systemic therapy and did the research in converting HEC-293 processes and experiments into the back of the virus mm -hmm. system for production of the capsids. It's not an easy task. There's a lot of things that go along with that, a lot of uh, back and forth, and you develop that technology. But as you do it over and over again, you understand the, uh, the nuances in how you can make that transition more easily, and also those critical uh, quality parameters that you can measure to fine tune to make sure that you get the appropriate uh, conversion, as well as the confidence that that product will work in the experiments and into the clinic. Yeah, I definitely agree on the viral vector side. There are a lot of opportunities to efficiently scale up the processes and also improve the productivity. On the cell therapy side, and I see close the system and automation would be key, especially for autologous therapies. The current process is just a very manual and open processes um, in the clean room is costly from facility construction perspective, maintenance perspective, and operational perspective. And I think there are a lot of opportunities in that space as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you set this panel up with the guys that have the easy manufacturing <laughs> uh, challenge over here with just AAV, <laughs> put it in the body and it does its <laughs> Versus the lentiviral autologous cell yeah. companies that were here that have a dual I agree with you on the, on the uh, uh, certainly on the viral vector side, I, I think we, we all have technologies that are going to be broadly applicable to bring the cost down. The, the drug product side, it, it's, I think it's a um, the advances that are coming 
um, are interesting. Obviously, the automation, the closed systems are going to help, but it really all is all about scale. And when you've got companies like ours that have such small populations that mm -hmm. we're serving, it's very difficult to figure out the scale efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, more products through facilities that can optimize the, um, the throughput of, of those, those programs is, is key. Uh, and I think the other one is technologies like uh, cryopreservation of, of the cells, mm -hmm. where today, for not all of us, but some of us, um, the need to get the cell from apheresis, collecting out of the patient, into the, to the process, uh, the drug, drug uh, product process, um, and the transduction process is time critical. Um, and so, as you can imagine, if you have to process a cell within a short period of time, you have no flexibility at all in terms of gaining efficiencies on the manufacturing side. So something like, and there are others, other technologies out there as well, like prior, prior preservation, which I know a lot of companies, including Bluebird, are working on, really can change not only the cost of goods and the efficiency, mm -hmm. because now you have uh, somewhat flexibility to determine when certain products go through the transduction process and you can uh, optimize for that. But it also allows for a broader uh, reach on a global basis and therefore you can get more of those patients coming into a central facility um, and then you get further optimization on scale. So we definitely have a, a unique challenge mm -hmm. on the drug product side that I believe will, will ultimately um, accomplish great things on the efficiency side and the cost of goods side but it's gonna take some of these, both scale, efficiency, and new technologies um, to really bring it down to a point that we feel um, quite good about. And then the automation and the closed systems and all that will just continue to, to yeah. help further as well. You know, I completely agree with you, and I think autologous therapy companies, one of the biggest challenges we're facing is that the supply chain is completely different compared to the traditional pharmaceutical or even biological. Um, or even the easy companies. Guys over there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, from make to stock to make to order is a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. um, it, it creates such challenges when it comes down to production planning. To your point, everyone wants to increase the capacity utilization to lower the cost of goods. But if you're not able to plan and schedule your production, you have to make to order, that, that is a real challenge. That is a real challenge, and I like the way that you're thinking, and I think, you know, if we could really move the needle from truly make to stock, at least toward, uh, make to water, at least towards to make to stock, that will reduce some of the logistic challenges. So, but before we eventually open it up uh, to the audience for questions, which hopefully you've all been saving in, in your mind to ask, want to talk a little bit about the future. So five years from now, we're sitting up here on, in this place, hopefully a little later, maybe more like eight. Um, <laughs> what do you think will be notably different? How do you see the market evolving significantly in the next three to five years? Tim, you want to go first? A revamp, a revamp healthcare system? <laughs> <laughs> you think we're going to get there in three to five years? No, no. You're an optimist. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the big, with so many products that I think we all see coming to approval, we'll be talking more about, um, you know, the next phase of gene therapy and cell therapies. Is it going to be more approaches for delivery, or is it going to be more approaches for, you know, something like gene editing? Right? So that's the next phase of, we've all looking at gene replacement strategies or lentiviral strategies. You know, what's, the what's going to be the next big thing in the next three to five years? I'm not yeah. sure we know. Other, other comments? Yeah, I have uh, yeah. a, a few things. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, we've had tremendous uh, accomplishments uh, with the approval of products that uh, essentially cures SMA, uh, take, uh, cures blindness, as well as uh, the childhood leukemias and adult lymphomas. So it's been major, major changes. So that's the proof of concept. I think uh, some of the things we can look forward to is uh, the, with the CAPS is, is a rheostat. In other words, how can you turn off the gene? If it uh, causes toxicity, how can you dial it back? Not turn it off totally, on off, but actually dial it back. So you could actually determine the levels of uh, proteins uh, based upon a measurement and then turning it back either on for efficacy, turning it up, or 
for uh, safety turning it down. So I think that'll be key. I think delivery will improve. Uh, I think right now the, the main ways to get into the brain is actually opening up the skull and putting a, a cannula in. And this may seem very archaic in a few years when you have capsids that can actually be very specific, penetrating the blood-brain barrier and going to specific spots automatically, and you can monitor that with tags and things like that. So I think those are important. Uh, the third thing I think will be uh, gene editing, and, and I think it's going to be revolutionary how that's going to come about, how is that going to be delivered, and uh, tr truly remarkable things are, are coming in store. Excellent. I, I can't wait for that world where you no longer have to inject something directly into the brain. <laughs> Sounds like a good place to be. Other, other comments? So I think uh, <clears throat> we're really at the precipice of, of approvals here. Um, you know, we have about a handful of these cell and gene therapies that have been approved, um, many of them just happening over this, this year in 2019. Um, but there are over 200, 250 that are in, or even more in, that are in clinical trials right now. So over the next five years, we're going to see, um, I, I think, hundreds being approved. And, uh, you know, we're going to see things like, you know, potential cures for hemophilia, which is really exciting, um, lysosomal storage diseases and things like this that have, are going to have a real impact on, you know, patients and kids' lives. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that, that piece of it. Um, and then, you know, it, it, if and when we start to see success and, and durability of these products, um, I can see the, the, the field heading towards um, maybe not disease, curing diseases, but more, you know, more chronic diseases versus genetic diseases. And, um, you know, we're already starting to see products and, and requests for manufacturing come in for those types of, of uh, gene therapies. Um, and I can see that that would be an area where we'd start to see more. Excellent, excellent. Seems like we're going down the line. Um, <laughs> yep. so, so I think we'll be an established modality. Uh, in, in the industry. Not that we aren't today, but I think there's still skeptics out there. And I believe that we'll be an established modality in particular in the areas that we've shown promise already, which is in the genetic diseases um, and or known genetic diseases and in uh, liquid tumors. Uh, I do believe in five years we will start getting into these broader markets, the broader indications. Um, I'm sure it's going to be fits and starts, but we'll have some success there. And we at Bluebird are big, big believers that the solid tumor um, market is tractable. It's going to take a lot of iterative, translational um, experimentation uh, preclinically, and then as I was describing before, clinically, to really understand how to break through that uh, protective environment for solid tumors. But we are big believers that it's going to happen, um, and it's just a matter of time and experimentation and understanding. Yeah. Uh, the great thing is we have the tools now. We absolutely have the tools to understand it. We just don't have the experimentation to understand it. And so that's what the next five years, I think, are, are about. And I think we're going to see great things uh, in that area. And then near and dear to us, I think we'll see a payment system that has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, I said this yesterday that I am hopeful. I don't know that we're going to get there in five years, but I'm hopeful that we're going to hear um, the HTA bodies, the U.S. payers, both government and commercial, uh, parrot back some of the things we're saying today, which is, why aren't we considering a pay-for-performance over time that's outcomes-based for this? Yeah. Challenging us to say, why aren't we doing that? Because, frankly, it's just the right thing to do from an industry perspective, and it feeds well into what we're all doing. So I, I really believe, based on the feedback you're getting from payers of an interest in this, that we will be there. Um, yeah. Again, you'll have fits and starts, and you'll have leaders and, and followers, but uh, there, there absolutely is momentum in that direction, and that's exciting. That's really exciting. Right. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I think it's very exciting to see those scientific breakthroughs and uh, to see the promises to leverage the science and the technologies to not only going after rare diseases, but also broader popula populations, larger disease. I do think one of the biggest challenges is how are we going to industrialize this remarkable cell and gene therapies? And I hope in the next five years, we will see real breakthrough to allow us to industrialize 
lots of therapies. So you know, some of the challenges will be overcome. And we're not here talking about how we can make the product, but more of how we can advance the science and to bring the therapies to broader patient populations. Well, I'm sure we all look forward to all of those things coming true. Yeah. Um, let me open it up to the audience here today. What questions do you have that the panel hasn't already touched on? I think we have a microphone right there. Um, maybe just come to the center if you're interested in asking a, a question of anyone on the panel. Questions, anyone? Oh, gentleman right there. Oh, you <laughs> can throw the mic. Um, this is about the CDMO space. I, I heard some good discussion around tapping into CDMO's platforms and experience um, to help startup companies move forward. I see two different kind of models out there. I see some CDMOs that are really all in on providing cell lines and platforms, and then I see CDMOs that don't have those, although they'll do anything that the, the clients come to them with. So I'm wondering what you all see as uh, you know, the direction. Is one of those models better from a developer point of view, from a CDMO point of view, and where is that all going? Nicole, do you want to comment? Tim? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it kind of leverages on some of the earlier parts of the discussion around it's helpful when you're working with a CDMO that's done it before because there's an increased level of confidence because the most precious thing that you've got in your development cycle is time. Right, because that's going to equate for everything else. So working with a, a group like Brammer, for example, that has done, you know, that type of either cell therapy production or lentiviral or AAV, you know, is going to save you a lot of time and provide you confidence. And that goes across the board for both your team, the investors you're working with. I mean, especially if you're thinking of a startup mentality, that's you really need that. I think it's important for a CMO really to offer both. Um, there are, it's never a one size fits all uh, for, for these products. Uh, and there isn't yet one technology that's the clear winner for how to produce some of these things. Um, you know, some of the things we talked about earlier, some of the processes and, and technologies aren't scalable, while others are scalable, but they have upfront time and effort to get them put in place. Um, so you need to be you need to have uh, a flexible CMO who can offer the upfront cell lines and starting materials and be able to provide those platforms um, if you need them, but you also need a CMO who is able to take what you've developed or your cell lines um, because you might have your own strategic way of producing them or your st own strategic technologies um, and, and be able to then leverage the the capabilities and the equipment and the systems. Um, and, and so I, I don't know that yeah. they'll ever, it'll ever, I think it'll always be kind of a, a balance and, and the flexibility is what's probably good. Absolutely. Maybe one other comment uh, um, makes total sense because there's so <coughs> many companies out there needing different things yeah. at different stages of their, their life cycle as well. I think the one thing that we have focused on, there's a couple things. One is capacity and flexibility obviously is critical. Um, but the other is quality systems, uh, really making sure from a platform perspective that there's a huge commitment to the quality systems. Um, and, and so that, that's one of the key criteria for us going into a CDMO is making sure that there's a great comfort with not just what they have in place, but executive commitment to continuously improving the quality systems so that you're keeping up with standards, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, it's really, really important and it can really catch you if, it's, if, if the quality systems aren't up to snuff. Uh, absolutely. Other questions from the audience? Oh, back there. Hi. So I'll apologize up front. I missed the first um, five, ten minutes, so you may have covered this already, but in case you haven't. Um, so one of the potential challenges in um, developing patient specific gene modified cell therapies is potential variability in the starting material you're actually getting from patients. Um, then the further modification and going back into patients. What are the panel's thoughts on is the starting material variability a real challenge? And if it is, how are you thinking about tackling that challenge to ensure that as we go forward we make more and more consistent products? Great question and we did not cover it in the first okay. five to ten Phew. minutes. Who on the panel would like to tackle that one? 
Um, I can uh, I can take uh, the first step, and maybe my uh, fellow panelists can can add on to it. I do think that's a real challenge, and what we're dealing for, especially autologous gene therapy or cell-based gene therapy, and your starting materials are from patient, and there's a patient-to-patient -patient variabilities um, that are inherent to to your process, and it's uh, difficult to standardize, <laughs> and so it's a. Uh, very different from a traditional manufacturing perspective. You think about the control, we always think about, okay, we want a, a consistent processes and to achieve a consistent product quality. Maybe another way to think about it is that if you have a different starting material that has that variability, is that the control strategy still relevant? Can you use the same control strategy with a very different and the variable starting materials to achieve the same consistent product quality and consistency. I, I think it begs the question. I do think it's a key to have a deeper understanding of what those variabilities means, what are relevant and what are not relevant to the product quality, to the clinical efficacy. I think we have a long way to go to understand our product and to really link the critical quality attributes to the clinical outcome. So there are a lot of room and opportunities over there. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, and, and I, I know there um, are some therapeutic developers here who have already engaged in conversations with the FDA to start talking about a world where you would have um, an adapted protocol in those starting steps with clear measurements that would determine how you would adapt that protocol, but with the end in mind, you know, that you're gonna have this variable starting material, but you ultimately wanna get to a certain cell density or a certain, you know, composition of that, that product you're mm -hmm. gonna deliver in, into the patient and that you may have to treat that starting material differently because of the variability. Yeah. Um, I think we're really at the beginning of that journey, but I'm at least optimistic that those conversations are starting to happen and, and that um, our friends in, in the FDA seem to understand the challenge and are open to working with therapeutic developers to solve it. Yeah, that, that is definitely very promising. And I agree with you, adaptive control is one way to go, starting with the understanding of the product and with the end in mind. Um, and I also think that maybe another area that this industry um, also need to tap into is really the power of uh, digital technologies, integrated data analytics. Um, really pull the data together and turn the data into insight, and I don't think that we're doing that enough. I totally agree with that. I was going to go there as well. I, I think um, <clears throat> a couple of things. One, uh, I think that we need more technologies that okay. are geared toward understanding and characterizing the cells, um, separation technology, characterization technology, etc. cetera. Um, that will further advance our understanding of uh, the cells and what's important and what cell types are important. Um, certainly taking the clinical learnings and the scientific learnings and deeply understanding them through data analytics is, a, is an area that we, we really haven't had a chance to invest in because we haven't had the volume of data to, to understand and we're getting that now. So mm -hmm. I think you're also gonna see an evolution there where the world is gonna pick up in terms of the learnings mm -hmm. from the data that we're collecting. I'm sure you're investing in it. We're investing actually pretty heavily in that now. Yeah. Uh, because we now have a data set that actually can, is interpretable mm -hmm. yeah. and gives us the ability to, um, uh, to generate insights, as you, as you mentioned. So I think that's uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, in important. Mm -hmm. We did discuss this earlier on, but I think it's very important, again, to stress the imp importance of vendor qualification. Really look at the specifications of the material you're receiving from the starting materials and also look at are there other uh, vendors for, the, for that material. Uh, there are occasions where these vendors are, will be out of stock for those materials or uh, they will make changes mm -hmm. uh, or they'll have things in there that uh, you didn't anticipate and as you're going down the line that could be detrimental to the product and for removal. Other such things as the culture media. 
uh, very important minor changes in the uh, addition or deletion of various factors in the, in the media can cause dramatic effects on the productivity uh, of the cell. So it's uh, very important to really look at that and have control of that and confidence that they're producing this reliably and consistency and we'll have the supply for you when you need it. And then the starting material of the vector, right, that goes into the cell therapy, Absolutely. right, there's a lot of um, increasing pressure to characterize the product quality of that mm -hmm. vector and to um, implement purification of it, um, moving away from just the sprinkling harvest on the cells <laughs> to now, you know, really you know, implementing purification, looking at the product quality of that and how it can affect the product quality of your cells. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And then also the transgene, how well is that characterized in the sequencing there, uh, as well as promoters, where are the promoters coming from, what is the source, and uh, how consistent are they in, in what they do. And so you go through that qualification, really understand the starting materials and the variances that could occur. And, and certainly as a, as a vendor that serves the, the cell and gene therapy market, I can say that quality and assurance of supply are two things that we're incredibly focused on. And to your point, the market is evolving so quickly that expectations on what quote unquote quality means in this market um, requires a lot of uh, active driving of change requires us evolving very quickly in the same way that our, our partners are so we can make sure uh, that we are delivering starting materials that meet that, that bar. Um, and, you know, I, I would assume it is a focus area for all vendors who are serving this market, but I can say it's certainly a focus area for Thermo Fisher. So. Other questions? Ah, right here in the front. We have a microphone, someone will toss at you apparently. <laughs> if you can dodge a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a great one. <laughs> um, continuing along the lines of the starting material, um, Charles Mooney with the um, Blood Centers of America. And uh, one of the things that we see a lot when we are implementing protocols for people is that uh, they're asking for a number of blood volumes to be processed instead of giving us an exact cell count of something uh, that they would like. Uh, so, you know, our systems are really set up. Uh, they were set up to do C34 for stem cell transplantation. And so they have, we have flow cytometers and cell counters. And what we're used to doing is getting a yield um, that uh, we're targeting instead of number of blood volumes processed. But I will tell you that the vast majority of the protocols that we get, uh, they want to tell us how many blood volumes to process, not what the yield of the starting material needs to be. That guarantees variability because uh, the starting count is different and the body weight is different of every single person that walks in. And so I just wondered if there uh, was an appetite amongst the industry to begin to standardize to say, uh, if you're collecting a uh, CD34 product, if you're collecting a T-cell product, that this is what a standard yield uh, of that product would be and that um, the orders come in as a percentage of, um, of those standard products. Great question. Who would like to comment? You know, uh, <laughs> I think that's a, um, that's a great suggestion. Um, we, we haven't really moved um, towards the, that upstream just yet, right? So right now our process is still very much focused on we take the free cis material and we go from there. But I agree with you, there's opportunities to further standardize the collection of the starting material. And if we can get a little bit better control over there, that will help us down the road to reduce some of the variabilities that we have seen. I agree. What do you think? Uh, I agree as well. I think the one, the one challenge for that is, is uh, that we're all still learning as to what a good starting material from a cell count perspective is for an individual indication. And I know, and, and the transduction efficiency matters for that. Um, obviously, because if you've got a very low transduction efficiency, you're going to demand higher cells so that you get enough transduced cells to go back to have an effect on the body versus if you have a very high 
transduction efficiency you need. It, it, it uh, lessens the burden on the cell count on the upfront. I think we're still in the learning stages of trying to understand that on an indication by indication and technology by technology basis as to what is an adequate cell dose. Um, but I do agree, it's a good idea. It's something that maybe ARM should take up um, as one of the thing, one of the initiatives mm -hmm. over the ensuing years to think yeah. about. Yeah, great question. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more. Well, just wait for the mic so they can <laughs> hear you. Um, my question is more for CDMOs. How do you manage your operational risks? So for a platform that has ultra centrifugation, it's labor intensive, how do you manage the risk? Yeah, um, very carefully. <laughs> 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 um, you know, it, it is, I think, you try to lessen those types of risk. Obviously, you try to mitigate them right up front. Um, so we try not to do things like centrifugation. Uh, we try to move toward technologies that are going to be lower risk, um, scalable, and um, operationally viable. Um, it has benefit to the CMO because um, less failed batches, and it has obvious advantage to the client because um, it's going to be less time cost and money for them to develop those kinds of things. So we try to mitigate those, those operational risks up front to begin with. Um, we try to quantitate them. So we do formal risk assessments um, right up front of a process that might be coming in, identify what those risks are, uh, the likelihood of them happening, um, what the criticality of that risk is if it does happen, and, and then really hone in and try to mitigate the top ones, um, the ones that you can't, um, then it really is just making sure that both parties understand those risks going in. Um, and um, you know, I, I think trying to handle it that way is, is, is about the best way that you can do it. Um, certainly the formal risk assessments are really important um, and, and making sure that both parties understand and, and there's clear communication on how you're mitigating those risks, or, or if you're not, how you're going to, um, how you're going to deal with uh, the outcome if, if you have a, a poor outcome. And, you know, you can do things like, um, you know, simultaneous thaws or things, you know, backups, so that if you do have a, an operational issue that you um, think is a relatively high chance or probability, then you can, you, you at least have something to back up on uh, pretty quickly so that it, it, it lessens the impact. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more, if there are any other questions in the audience. All right, so I want, would like you all to help me thank the panel for joining us this morning.